Well, if you have your Bibles, we're going to continue our series, and today we're going to go through uh, 2 Corinthians chapter 4, and I base uh, the entire message on this chapter, so we'll read it first, and then I'll go back and uh, take some of the verses out of it as we look at uh, how to stay motivated. Staying motivated for the journey. And I might even add in that in parentheses, especially at our age. <laughs> How do you stay motivated? <clears throat> Second Corinthians 4, and I'll be reading out of King James. <clears throat> Therefore, seeing we have this ministry, as we have received mercy, we faint not, but have renounced the hidden things of dishonesty, not walking in craftiness, nor handling the word of God deceitfully, but by manifestation of the truth, commending ourselves to every man's conscience in the sight of God. <clears throat> but if our gospel be hid, it is hid to them that are lost, in whom the God of this world has blinded the minds of them which believe not, lest the light of the glorious gospel of Christ who is the image of God, should shine unto them. For we preach not ourselves, but Christ Jesus the Lord, and ourselves your servant for Jesus' sake. For God, who commanded the light to shine out of darkness, has shined in our hearts to give the light of the knowledge of the glory of God in the face of Jesus Christ. But we have this treasure in earthen vessels that the excellency of the power may be of God and not of us. We are troubled on every side, yet not distress. We are perplexed, but not in despair. Persecuted, but not forsaken. Cast down, but not destroyed. Always bearing about in the body the dying of the Lord Jesus, that the life also of Jesus might be made manifest in our body. For we which live are always delivered unto death for Jesus' sake, that the life also of Jesus might be made manifest in our mortal flesh. So then death works in us, but life in you. We have the same spirit of faith, according as it is written, I believed and therefore have I spoken. We also believe and therefore speak, knowing that he which raised up the Lord Jesus shall raise up us also by Jesus and shall present us with you. For all things are for your sakes, that the abundant grace might be through the thanksgiving of many redound to the glory of God. For which cause we faint not, but, through our, but though our outward man perish, yet the inward man is renewed day by day. For our light affliction, which is but for a moment, worketh for us a far more exceeding and eternal weight of glory. While we look not on the things which are seen, but on the things which are not seen. For the things which are seen are temporal, but the things which are not seen are eternal. Second Corinthians <clears throat> chapter four. I think in your notes at the beginning it says something about the alarm clock going off at five. For some of you it might be four, some of you six, some of you don't have an alarm clock. But we do know the minute that does go off and you have a conscious awareness are you excited? Are you ticked off? Are you dreading the day? You know, it depends sometimes how we're feeling of how we approach those first couple moments. I remember when I had COVID and for about 10 days, oh, that was, I had it bad. And Heidi had, what do you call it, asystematic or whatever. She had it took it really well. But man, I was moaning and groaning and, and I'd wake up and I just dreaded it because I was in pain. So I couldn't wait, wait to go out of misery again. And, 
You don't get and stay motivated when you're sick. And I know there's other things, death, traumas, there's a lot of things. But just for the most of our life, how do we stay motivated, especially as believers in the journey? We're not always going to feel like this guy. I used to love to hike. I loved to go to the top of Tanea Peak or the pinnacles over here and just get at the top and there's something very exhilarating about being on top of the mountain. And the motivation to get up there uh, was something else. <laughs> well, I'm going to tell you about a man in 1946. He went to work that day, William Camillo. He was having a bad, bad day in 1947. He got in a bad argument with his wife. His children had not been speaking to him for a long time. They would not give him a raise. He was a bus driver, <clears throat> one of those buses. And during the ride as a New York transit bus driver, during the ride that day, he just says, why don't I just keep going? Instead of turning into the compound, he kept going and going and going. And 1,136 miles later, he pulled into Tampa Bay, Florida. He parked the bus, hid it under some trees, and then he started walking. After four or five days, the wife and the people of the business, they were all upset. They thought there was foul play involved, and they began to search him. And two weeks later, they found him in Tampa Bay. They asked him what was going on. And he said, well, I just had that simple question. What would it be like if I just kept going? And I found out. He said, I enjoyed it for a while. Then the, the reality of life hit him and they took him back. He got arrested for stealing the bus. <clears throat> but have you ever felt like that? Have you ever felt like, I just feel like I'm going to keep going. I had that happen to me because I wasn't paying attention. I was coming back from San Jose uh, one night late. I got on the Altamont in my GTO. And you know, you turn off, and uh, instead of going, turning off to Modesto, I kept going, and, and I don't know, I was in a daze or something, I just kept going, and finally I seen a sign to Fresno. <laughs> so I had to make an, an uh, U-turn or I, on I-5, and it took me a long time to get home, but I don't know, I just, I wasn't mad at anything, I just kept going. But I think there's times in our life that people get despondent and how do you stay motivated? How do you stay motivated in your, your church, your families, your marriages? How do you stay motivated? An old man was asked one time, how do you stay motivated in your marriage? He says, well, this is what works for us. <clears throat> we go out twice a week to a nice meal in a nice restaurant. She goes on Mondays, I go on Fridays. <laughs> That's really not very funny. <laughs> oh. Well, here's three men. They all actually despaired of their life. The Bible says that Paul despaired of his life. He traveled thousands of miles and Sometimes during those journeys, he got unmotivated. He was hounded, persecuted, stoned. And there was days in his life, there was one time he said, I despaired of my life. Elijah, he ran 112 miles to Beersheba because some lady said she was going to cut his head off. And he powdered under a tree. Wisest man that ever lived. They say he may have traveled down to see Queen of Bathsheba. Uh, and I don't know if that's true or not. It doesn't say that in the Bible. 
But he actually said one time, maybe it's in the second chapter, I hate my life. So even in the wisest man, one of the great evangelists, one of the great prophets, there's times in all of our lives that things get really tough. And last week we looked at problems that come into our life and how we can feel rejected and, and do these kind of things and how the, the problems when they slam into us, how do we react? But the question I have today is, how do I stay motivated through my problems? When we read here this morning, it says in 2 Corinthians 4 and 1, we're really not to lose heart, are we? Paul's saying that. He says in verse 8, don't give up, don't quit. He says the same thing back in verse, uh, down in verse 16, don't lose heart. He says, we're not abandoned, struck down, but we're not destroyed. And yet all of us in this room would recognize that our journey, even as a believer, it is not smooth sailing. There are some days we're ecstatic. It's, it's fun. It's enjoyable. But some days and some moments get very, very tough. So how do we stay Motivated. How do we take the impossible and say, I'm possible? Well, you tear it up. <laughs> and I thought first, before we give you a few of those, I think I have four down there at the bottom. Yeah. What are some motivation sappers that you face? And since I'm a human, and you are too, I'll just share some of the ones that sap me, so I'm sure they sap you. Here's one. Folks, I'm getting very frustrated when I have failures. That's a motivation sapper. Have you ever had a failure? And you could go big failures, small failures. It upsets me. One of my failures is um, once in a while I'll actually lose my temper. <laughs> and that's a sapper to me. You feel that bad, you got to go apologize to Heidi or your children or your grandchildren or somebody. And it really frustrates me when I lose my temper. It frustrates me when I run red lights. <clears throat> And most of the time is when Heidi says, you just ran that light and I'm not paying, I'm not paying attention. <laughs> Fortunately, I haven't had any wrecks because of that, but I've got to pay attention. And I'm, I get my mind on something and I either am quoting or talking and I'm not paying attention. Shame on me. That's a failure. And you can think about your own failures. A couple weeks ago, there's a friend I knew that had an individual die in his family and I kept saying I was going to go over and I never did it. <clears throat> Called him on the phone and apologized. But I failed. I should have went. The minute the Holy Spirit convicted me, I should have done it. Failures. What about this one? When I am focused on my performances... I go, stay motivated. Some of you in here have been pastors, and uh, some of you are still pastors. And I will tell you that when I focus on my performance as a pastor and the expectations, it's a killer. I'm going to tell you why. Because it is expected of a preacher or a pastor the next sermon better be better, and the next one better, and it never ends. Well, to walk up here and have to have a better sermon every time, and live a better life during the week each time, and be the perfect example as a husband, that is an expectation. When you look at your performance, that's a motivation killer. So you got to get off of that. You got to take your eyes off yourself. But 
Sometimes it's a big thing and maybe you folks face the same thing. When you focus on your own performance and you realize there's times you don't do very good, it's a sapper. Do you ever feel like you have to have the perfect marriage or the perfect children? I thought Heidi and I was going to have perfect children. We did when they were six months old. And I love my children, but man, they did not. Um, well, I'm glad they're not in here. I love them and they're, they love us today, but they made choices that we wouldn't have made. And I make probably choices they wouldn't have made. And boy, the conflicts of raising that is just, it's, it's a burden sometimes. Love them. And then grandchildren. I'm glad I never killed my children because I have grandchildren. But the performances of that is even a grandparent to treat all the grandchildren the same. Have you ever had a grandchild come up to you? Grandpa, am I your favorite grandchild? And three more are standing right there. So you're forced to lie. No, you just say, I love you all the same. Yeah, but am I the best? No. Anyway, but performance, a sapper. Here's another one. When I feel rejected. Have you ever felt rejected? It's a motivation sapper. Heidi and I, we have our little pity parties. We'll uh, drive, be driving. Why hasn't Craig called us this week? Or why don't Joe Lynn and Paula call us like they did three years ago? Well, they're busy. Have you ever felt that about your children? I mean, if, and they're not rejecting you. They love you, but when they don't call, they don't come over. After a while, you just feel rejected, and that can, it's a motivation sapper. I want to tell you about what happened to me one time. Um, it's three o'clock in the morning, and I get a call from my brother Aaron, and he says, Gordon, we have a problem. So one of our big accounts, we did a lot of almond harvesting. One of our big accounts just called. He is upset to the nth degree. He wants us to come into his house right now of what happened out in his orchard. We had six of these almond shakers, almond shakers. I call them almonds. And on the heads of the old almond shakers, they had that, what is those called, Bob? The sleeves the pads yeah and the slings and they get hot well I had two boys from Virginia that we didn't train good enough and you're supposed to take the pads out and rotate them because they get hot well they slipped out at two o'clock in the morning they were shaking the trees with metal and we got over there and on the way over usually Aaron and I drive fast we just we thought you know he's going to Will he shoot us? Will he? We didn't know. And obviously we felt very rejected, scared to death to pull up to his house. We went out in the almond orchard first and the boys were literally crying because these were barked. These trees were white. <clears throat> well, they're going to die. We bought two 50 gallon drums of, of tar and a couple of them live, but <clears throat> a tree produces 50 to 60 pounds of nuts. You figure that out with two or 300 trees. Tens of thousands. And that's not counting the next year and the next year. So here we were walking up to the house. And you talk about feeling down and rejected. We didn't. We were just. And I'm going to tell you what happened. The guy that opened the door. He had had time to think about it in the hour or so it took Tills to get to his home. This is what he said. Wouldn't it be great if the Lord would come at this moment? <laughs> he was a Christian man. Hallelujah. And we just lit up and he says, guys, it's, it's a mistake. Don't fire the guys. Don't do what you can. If we keep them alive, fine. I know you'll replace them. You guys, whatever you want to do. And, and I think we went back and 
maybe replaced a couple of them a couple of years later, but man, what a change. Our metabolism changed overnight. Just you're feeling terrible and all of a sudden, man, we've motivated again. But sometimes when you get rejected, here's another one. <clears throat> when I don't see results that has ever sapped your motivation or even rewards you could put there. When I don't see the results after riding my exercise bike, I get ticked off. <laughs> I would love if Mr. T's would use less sugar. And, uh, but think about that. A lot of times we, we like to see results, not just physically, but in other things, in our studies or whatever, we like to see better results. Sometimes, well, we expect a, a reward. Well, sometimes they don't come. Well, don't let it sap you. So, I love this picture. We're going to consider four ways to stay motivated. That's not a real picture, is it? I don't think so. It looked like a monkey. <laughs> so, as we look, as we look into 2 Corinthians chapter 4, uh, let's look at some ways that we jotted down. There's more. I just chose four here. <clears throat> Number one, always remember God's grace and his mercies. Look at verse one. Therefore, since through God's mercy, we have this ministry, don't, we don't lose heart. And that's sometimes a, a hard thing to understand that God's love for us, like Joel was talking about today, it is unconditional, it never ends. I don't care how many trees you wrecked, it never ends. His love, his mercies are new every morning, they're every, every day. All the time. And I am so thankful as I look at the word of God and it tells us how much he loves us. That God did not exhaust his mercy when he came to me. And to you. It never ends. He took a person like me that was caught up in a do, 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 do religion it's all about performance that is a killer. And he took me to have some understanding by the grace of God that I'm a, in a done religion. It's already done. I walk into his grace. And when he said it is finished on the cross, he really meant it. He didn't say, Gordon, I got it started. Now you finish it. That's a do religion. You'll never end. That's all other religions, by the way. Christianity is a relationship because we understand we are living from something that was done for us. It's a free gift. Always remember God's grace and God's mercies. I'm going to tell you what you are and you're going to get upset at me. But you are nothing more than a crackpot. Sorry, you are a crack pot. We are just earthen vessels and we are cracked and we are broken and we have a lot of uh, things wrong with us. But verse 7 says, but we have this treasure in earthen vessels that the excellency of the power may be of who? Of God, not of us. It's not about us. You go ahead and try to have the perfect pot, you're going to struggle with your whole life. It's not about us. It's all about him. And that's how we can have reflection when we realize it's the Lord. We are the light of the world. He's living in us and he wants us to reflect his light. That's why serving the Lord should never be a burden. Because we are saved. If you're trying to work for it, man, you're going to go through the energy of your flesh. You're going to be wore out the whole time. It, we're a done deal. Serving should never be a burden. It is a privilege when we remember God's grace and mercy. 
Every morning you wake up, light is being imparted to your vessel because of his mercy. It says, he has shine in our hearts. That's amazing. Light is shining through us. The life of the Lord Jesus being made manifest in our bodies. Always remember God's grace. Number two, refocus on the Lord Jesus Christ, for he is the light. When I started driving down I-5, I lost focus. Quit looking at the signs, whatever I was doing, and I went for miles on a detour. There's times in our Christian journey that we get a little off the path. And he just wants us to stop. Like what he says, verse 5 and 6. For we do not preach ourselves, but Jesus Christ as Lord. And ourselves as servants for Jesus' sake. For God, who commanded the light to shine out of darkness, has shined in our hearts. <clears throat> to give the light of the knowledge of the glory of God in the face of Jesus Christ. When I get down and I begin to focus on me, then I got to stop and I need to refocus on the Lord Jesus Christ. Me, me, myself, and I. That's really the, the society's mantra today. It's all about self. Did you realize it took me a lot of years, even as, as a pastor, <clears throat> To realize that I don't produce sheep. Sheep produce sheep. I don't produce sheep. I don't save anybody. Holy Spirit saves. But there's a time in my life I thought I produce sheep. What a joke. No, sheep produce sheep. I feed the sheep. You feed the sheep. You can equip, enrich, empower. But we don't do any saving. Sheep produce sheep. The shepherd just feeds them and warns them. Think about that. You focus on the Lord Jesus Christ and he is the light then it takes it off of yourself. Number three, do not take rejection personally. Look at verse four. The God of this age has blinded the minds of unbelievers so they cannot see the light of the gospel of the glory of Christ, who is the image of God. Everybody here has been rejected. Maybe you haven't been for years, but you remember in grammar school, times you were rejected. You remember uh, later on in life, uh, teenagers, you remember the times you were rejected. The first 75 women I asked said no. That wasn't right. But we've all felt rejected. By the way, who has a, the hardest, the boy or the girl? I think the guy does. But then my sister says, no, the girl has it, the hardest. I don't know. They're both hard. But refuse to take rejection personally. Who's the God of the age? Satan. He is the God of the age. He's the one that runs the gambling casinos. He's the one that runs all the, the sports arenas, the United Nations. You name it, he's behind it. Now there's good people involved in all of those. But he has blinded the minds and the hearts of so many people of anything that points to the Lord. Joel talked about genders. God designed man and woman. He did not design 150 genders. He has blinded the minds of people today. And that's the spiritual battle going on. There's times I have felt rejected from my children. And it's nothing about me. There's something going on in their family and their life that I'm clueless to. So sometimes when you feel like you're being rejected, it has nothing to do with you. God is working in every 
life, even in the ones that you think are rejected you. And if they're having a bad day, a bad moment, it's not about you. And that took my wife and I a long time to learn. <clears throat> Sometimes you have a friend that hasn't called you for a while. It's not about you. They don't hate you. There's trauma going on in every life. So don't take it personal all the time. And don't take rejection because <clears throat> people that treat you wrong or sometimes they're not rejecting you. They're dealing with something that is not even related to your life. Look at this guy. I remember as a teenager reading about Richard Wormbrand, Torture for Christ. He wrote 18 other books. He's a Romanian pastor. Incredible story. 28 years, I think, he was in prison, beaten, tortured, got out. His wife was in prison a couple years. <clears throat> and um, one of the stories in there, there was a pastor in there with him. And he said, on my left side, the guard was beating this pastor. And the guard became so overwhelmed with his sin of beating the pastor that He knelt down next to him and started crying and asking for forgiveness. And the guy that was beaten, the pastor that was beaten, says, I love you, I love you, I forgive you. And the torturer died. But he came to the Lord before he died. Sometimes the very people that we feel like we're being rejected from, they have something else going on. <laughs> Bible says in 2 Timothy 2, in meekness instructing those who oppose themselves. What does that mean? It means there to do that which is contrary to one's good. Treat people gently. If I feel like I'm being rejected, I still need to be, uh, treat people gently. Some of these people that reject, they're blinded by the devil's schemes. They're blinded by the God of the age. And the cure for spiritual blindness is found in a statement made by Jesus. Remember after he healed the guy that was physically blind, Jesus says, Satan must be bound. I was with somebody in the altar room here recently. I haven't seen him for a while. And they came, oh, it was yesterday. Yeah. And they're, they're becoming members of the church. And, I, and we at, went around the room and asked all these questions. And they just said, we came and, and one of the things we do here, we, we cleanse homes that have demonic oppression. And we'll take a couple of us pastors, we'll go room to room, we'll pray over each room. Sometimes we'll go in and do, uh, we do a lot of homes where we, when somebody moves in, we'll dedicate the home. And I think it's great. Well, this couple said that when we bound Satan in their rooms, they've never had conflict again in there. We pray for that. If you have a conflict going in your family, your neighbors, whoever, just bind Satan by the power of the God's word. You don't have to have perfect oratory and say the right things. Just use the Bible. Let the Bible speak. And you, Satan can't handle the word of God. I have one Bible that is only dedicated. The only thing I use that Bible for is when I go to other homes to pray over the home. Why? Because I forget. And so I have bedroom, bathroom, living room, dining room, garage, animals, pets, kitchen. I have all of them tags with room numbers with scriptures. There is a scripture for every room of your house. Bathroom, all of them. And you pray the verse 
in the name of the Lord. I ought to bring a copy of these for you and just give them out to you. I will. That's just scriptures. And Jim, he knows you can go and pray with people that are even have suffered like this. This man prayed for his guards. I have seen Christians in communist prisons with 50 pounds of chains on their feet, tortured with red hot pokers, and whose throats spoonfuls of salt had been forced, being kept afterward without water, starving, whipped, suffering from cold, praying with fervor for the communists. This is humanly inexplicable. It is the love of Christ which is poured out in our hearts. Isn't that amazing? And he got out, him and his wife, he stood before Congress, pulled off his shirt, showed him the torture marks and everything. He lived to be 91, I believe, in Venice, California. <clears throat> That's where he died. So he had a, a, quite a few years here in California, but he went around preaching. Incredible book, Tortured for Christ. Refused to take rejection personally. And then, that's one of my favorite. Realize, you want to be motivated? The best is yet to come. You ever felt that you'd just like to go to heaven? If I would have a red button up here, and if you push the button, you go immediately to heaven, would you walk up and push it? First thing came to your mind right now, yeah, you'd do it, right? Did you know that if you had 24 hours to think about it, you wouldn't do it? Think about it. I went in a prison in Delano, and there was 100 men in there, and I said, I have a white button up here. You want to come up and push it? You go immediately to heaven. Would you do it? Hundred hands. At the end of the message, we shared a simple message. I asked him how many now would come up and do it? Very few. Because if you have time to think about it, you know you're going. You start thinking about your family, your friends, co-workers that don't know him. You start to reassess a few things that maybe you'd like to get done or share. still like to go to heaven. Think about it. <clears throat> Earth results. The best is yet to come. He says that all for, all, for this is for your benefit so that the grace that is reaching more and more people may cause thanksgiving to overflow to the glory of God. Heaven's still to come. We got a, a promise. He says here, for our light of, and, and momentary troubles are achieving for us an eternal glory that far out, outweighs them all. So we fix our eyes, not on that which is seen, but on that which is unseen. For what is seen is temporary, but what is unseen is eternal. Paul never one time considered death to be the end. Same with us. Death is not the end for us. That's why it says in Psalms, for our years are passing as just a watch in the night. A lot of changes that you've seen in this life, haven't you? My grandfather came here in 1900. This is the streets of Modesto, 1900. Same street when I was born in 1950. Same street from a different angle in 2021. In 1900, there was 2,024 people in Modesto. Modesto proper today is 414,000 people. You think there's been any changes? Been a lot of changes. 
Down at Rayleigh's down here is where we had a peach orchard. We'd have peach fights out there. There's a barn that used to be there that I got a spanking in. <laughs> Across the road here was a egg ranch by Uncle Roger Gish. I got another spanking there. <laughs> I had a tough, a tough life on this road. <laughs> But they're all passing away. Everything's passing away. I think heard somebody say, yard by yard, life is hard. Inch by inch, inch by inch, life's a cinch. You take one day at a time. And the key is you refocus and you always go to him. There's two things to motivate us to carry on. And these are the only two eternal things. You want to invest, and you want to enjoy the rest of your journey, and you want to stay motivated? You stay motivated to invest in the only two things that are eternal. The Word of God and people. The Word of God will never fade away. You will never cease to exist throughout eternity. And this young man right here, Thank you. Thank you. This is a servant of God that I don't think there's a week that goes by, Richard, is there, that you do not lead somebody to the Lord. Hardly a week. 128 last year. Every day. And he is motivated He'll come up to me in the hallway. He met somebody out here at the prayer garden. What'd they stop by for? The one that I told you about last week. Yeah. Yeah. He was asking for money. And I worked at the prayer garden. Yeah. Yeah, and I just love being around Richard. God has given him a gift to know how to say the right thing at the right time. If I go in and baptize somebody in a rest home, I take him. <laughs> we went in to baptize somebody and, and I didn't realize it, but she wasn't even saved. He got her saved, then we baptized her. <laughs> and God's given all of you different gifts. But there's some people I call, and he's one of them. If I bump into somebody that don't speak my language, I have people I call that does speak the language. I don't want to blow it. I can't speak Spanish very good. And I don't want to go, you like you, Jesus? I don't, know, I don't know how to say it right. <laughs> so I'll get somebody that will take him and lead him to the Lord because eternity is important. Very important. So just remember, you keep reading the Bible, you keep being around people and being encouragement to them, you will stay motivated. You'll stay motivated. Let's pray. <clears throat> Father, thank you. Everybody in this room, probably some sitting here don't think they're gifted, but they are. You have used them in a mighty way and maybe it's good sometimes we don't know. But thank you for the gifts you've given this body. This group of primetime people is, is an incredible motivation for me to see their lives, to see their excitement, to see their dedication. And they don't give up. They keep going. Thank you. Thank you for the word. May each one of us be invested in people and the word of God. And may we stay excited about it. And we thank you in Christ's name. Amen.